Um, abrupt climate change is a very hot topic in uh, paleoclimate, and, um, but we don't always consider um, when we look at some of the projections for the future that we are living in a time of abrupt climate change. Um, you know, this is the standard hockey stick, but these are the projections uh, for the next century added onto it. And so, uh, and we're following right now on the path towards the higher end of those projections. So, you know, we're gonna be far outside the climate state that we've lived in for the last thousand years, as will all the ecosystems um, on the planet. This isn't the same, though, as previous uh, climate changes, in part because, uh, and here's the CO2 record for the last 400,000 years from the Vostok ice cores, and again, projected future rise in CO2 um, just on the same scale to show you know, that we really are going into unprecedented times. Um, the two big differences are, um, well, the, the major difference is that CO2 right now is driving climate change rather than amplifying a temperature change. And so um, the same feedback mechanisms and um, the, might not apply um, since the driver is a little bit different. The second is that the rate of CO2 change is pretty fast. In these past changes, rates have been um, of the order of 30 per ppm for a thousand years was a fast change. But now um, the rates of change are about 30 par parts per million in 20 years. And the other, so that the time scales on which feedbacks are operating might be different. Um, and the, the, the gains that we saw in the paleo record um, may not be the same ones that are operating or, or dominating what we're going to see today. And the other reason is that um, lots of other things are changing besides just uh, CO2 and climate. Um, the best example on land is that we've changed fundamentally the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles um, in ways that are even bigger proportionally than we're changing the carbon cycle. Um, this is just a plot of uh, nitro nitrogen and phosphorus used in fertilizer. Um, we've changed obviously the land surface through our use of, um, of uh, agriculture um, and erosion and changes in uh, species composition with invasive species have really sort of fundamentally altered the way ecosystems are operating today in ways that we don't, um, are just beginning to really study and understand. So there are lots of ways in which, you know, I looked back at the title that I wrote for this talk and I realized there's no way I can talk about this in half an hour. Um, all, the base, all the feedbacks, physical and uh, biogeochemical between terrestrial ecosystems and the atmosphere. So I'm gonna limit myself to just two feedbacks and um, just carbon feedbacks between uh, terrestrial ecosystems and the climate. So um, if, for those of you, and most of you, I think here don't study terrestrial ecosystems, um, it's pretty simple. There's one process that brings carbon into terrestrial ecosystems, so that's the easy part. Um, photosynthesis um, uh, is the source of carbon, and uh, once it gets fixed, there's a variety of pathways and fates into, before it mostly gets respired, um, again, back to the atmosphere. So it can be um, allocated, it can either be respired relatively directly back to the atmosphere um, to fuel the plant's metabolism, or um, it can be allocated to growth, um, either to short-lived tissues like leaves, um, or to stems, or to roots, which are longer-lived, or it can be shuttled into the um, symbiont microbial community in exchange for nutrients that it gets back. Um, so there's various lifetimes within the plant itself, and then um, plant material dies, and uh, there's a whole host of this black box here that many here in the audience are opening up to study the processes of decomposition and the return of that material back to the atmosphere as CO2. We also have um, uh, disturbances like fire that act as shortcuts back to the atmosphere. So a lot of what I've been trying to do is uh, to look at what's the sort of the probability distribution function of uh, the age of carbon. How, how long does it take from a, a molecule that's fixed here to be returned to the atmosphere? And that will, depending on the various pathways that are taken, you could have very, sh you know, most things are come back in a very short time, but there's a long tail to this distribution. And um, that controls the magnitude of the, some of the feedbacks uh, between the carbon cycle and the atmosphere. 
So there are two that I'm going to um, talk about. Mostly one is a negative feedback, the uh, one of CO2 fertilization. Um, that operates basically with photosynthesis. If we increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, the idea is that plants will, uh, that, well, photosynthesis will certainly fix more carbon um, than it, the question is how much gets allocated to growth and stores carbon before it gets returned to the atmosphere. Obviously, the more carbon of that extra carbon that gets stored in longer uh, term uh, reservoirs, uh, the greater the capacity for this ecosystem to be a carbon sink with CO2 fertilization. The second feedback is a positive one, um, and that's based on the idea that decomposition is a temperature-dependent process. So the warming that accompanies elevated CO2 may uh, cause some of these processes to go faster, deplete the stores of soil organic matter, and put carbon back into the atmosphere. And again, um, that's in part dependent on how each of these various pieces, uh, uh, how temperature-dependent um, the decomposition, say, of stabilized versus uh, less stabilized soil organic matter might be. So um, this is our current understanding of the, the global carbon cycle and its feedbacks to the atmosphere. This is from the IPCC uh, fourth assessment report. Um, and it's the first time that cl cli climate carbon models that were coupled together. So you have to be forgiving because this is kind of the first stab at um, coupled carbon climate cycle models. But this is the prediction that, that m several different models have for land carbon uptake from 1850 to 2100. And you can see everybody agrees <laughs> where they should because we, we know what happened here. But once we start getting into the future, um, there's really strong divergence. And the reason for the divergence is basically the difference between those two feedbacks, the positive and the negative feedback. So um, some models with increasing CO2 into the future um, will uh, keep storing carbon, whereas other models, uh, the temperature dependence of decomposition starts to offset and then take over and you start losing carbon to the atmosphere. So, uh, you know, this is, the differences are big. I mean, we're talking in 2100, either a storage of 10 gigatons of carbon per year, which is, you know, compared to our present uh, input of CO2 to the atmosphere of about seven gigatons per year, that's pretty big, um, or losses of uh, the same order of, of about what our current pot fossil fuel emissions are. Um, I don't think anybody actually believes these two extremes, but um, the, the sort of median model now says that uh, storage will be about five or six gigatons per year, which, which is relying on the biosphere to take up a lot of our emissions. Um, and, you know, we got to hope that that's true. So, um, on the other hand, you know, the, the widespread in those predictions pretty much shows our, you know, models are just our understanding applied, you know, globally. And it shows that, that we're not very certain of these two feedbacks and how strong they're going to be. And I think, um, as someone who makes observations, I feel like, especially in the terrestrial carbon community, um, the models have far outstripped the observational evidence. And we need a lot more stringent tests of these models um, because, you know, some, we can't really believe those predictions that we just saw. So um, this is where radiocarbon comes in. The key uncertainties in these feedbacks really depend critically on how long carbon resides in those ecosystems, how long it takes for that carbon atom fixed by, by the plant to move through and be returned to the atmosphere on average. And we have a measurement that will tell us that. We have radiocarbon and how fast the bomb radiocarbon signature moves through and goes back to the atmosphere. So, uh, um, so much of my career has been spent looking at, you know, how old is the carbon stored in various forms and ecosystems? How old is the carbon leaving the system? And then we can um, model those fluxes and put that information in the context of whole ecosystem exchange with the atmosphere. So um, how do we do this? Um, it's, this? This is for those who aren't as familiar. Um, basically, what I'm going to show you are data of carbon respired from ecosystems, um, from a range of ecosystems, from tropical forests to tundra. Um, and what we see is usually the respired CO2 
um, what's coming from microbial decomposition, you get a, a C14 value somewhere around here. Um, I should mention I'm using these delta C14 units that you use for tracking bomb carbon. Um, it's the ratio of carbon-14 to 12 in the sample divided by that of a standard that's fixed in time. And we use the per mil notation as deviation from one times a thousand. Um, for those not familiar with radiocarbon, we do, if there's no mass-dependent information here, we do a mass, a correction to a common C13 value to get rid of mass-dependent fractionation and, and therefore we're just looking at movement of carbon, the tracer through the system. Um, so time or sources are what we get information on. Um, the zero in these units would then be the, the equal to the standard, which is the pre-industrial atmosphere. A thousand would be a doubling of radiocarbon. Um, and we almost got there with uh, atmospheric weapons testing in the early 1960s. And then after the moratorium on testing, um, we see a decline that's well documented um, since uh, 1964 uh, with, uh, as carbon-14 gets taken up by the oceans and the terrestrial biosphere. Um, so if we have a reservoir that's uh, labeled every year, like uh, with photosynthetic carbon from the atmosphere um, and a turnover and then respiration, uh, that would follow a pathway something like this where, you know, for shorter time turnover, you have a, a peak that's delayed less, and um, with longer turnover, you have more dilution and a more delayed peak. Um, the other thing you can do is just say, well, you know, for the last 15 years, you can also just say, well, the, the atmosphere last had that value um, about 10 years ago, and the two basically show the same thing. So the data I'm going to show you are from a range, as I said, of ecosystems. This is, this is many years of work that I'm, I'm going to just put on a few slides. Um, and so uh, tundra, two sites in the tundra, uh, several in uh, boreal forest and temperate forests, and then tropical forests. And there are a few grasslands and things uh, put in there as well. Um, this is a pretty low-tech measurement. Um, uh, people who do incubations will tell you there are a lot of artifacts with them. Um, all I can tell you is we've tested a lot of those artifacts, and carbon-14 seems to be fairly robust to those. So uh, a lot of the fluxes change, but the radiocarbon signature of what's respired does not, as long as we do a short-term incubation and substrate limitations don't come in. So we put our, our soil in a jar, um, and basically what I'm going to show you are comparisons between the, the carbon-14 and the organic matter in the soil and the carbon-14 of the CO2 respired by the microbes that are in that soil. So we're letting the microbes do the fractionation for us and tell us what the label, labile carbon is um, compared to the bulk carbon. And I'm going to show you, the, just to show you the data, um, I'm going to show you the difference between the atmosphere and uh, our measurement. And the reason I'm doing that is just uh, because we made the measurements across different years. The rate of decline of radiocarbon is um, constant enough in the 1990s that we can just uh, compare different years that way on one plot. So here's uh, the simple side. This is um, the surface litter. So you know we all know what that is. Um, in boreal ecosystems, you have slow decomposition rates, so you build up large litter layers, whereas you know, in tropical forests, we know that the litter decays rapidly. And so the C14, so this is the difference between the 14C of the bulk carbon versus what's being respired. And there's the one-to-one -one line. And I was actually really surprised that these two things fall on the same line, especially when you get to things like this. Uh, the red points here are sites that have low precipitation. Um, the blue have um, mostly forests and non-moisture uh, non limited decomposition rates. If we plot uh, the respired CO2 radiocarbon versus the mean annual temperature at the site, um, what you can see, and I've put on here approximate uh, residence times or years um, for that, um, we see that there's a some kind of temperature dependence there, which is good. We know that decomposition is temperature dependent. Um, this, however, is not just decomposition. It's uh, the, the time, the age of the respired carbon includes time spent in the plant as well as the time it takes to decompose. 
um, that you can see that the sites that are precipitate moisture limited decomposition don't fall on this line uh, or on this relationship. Um, so, you know, tropical forests actually here, we get two year old carbon being respired. Um, that's because the leaves stay on the trees for about two years before they fall and then they decompose very rapidly. Okay, so more interesting perhaps is the mineral soil. Um, so this is the part just, usually this is the zero to 10 centimeter layer just below the um, poorly decomposed material. And this is where we have a lot of the controversy. Um, so here's the C14 of the bulk organic carbon versus what's respired. And again, there's no relationship here um, uh, as opposed to what the litter is. And that's because there are a number of processes that stabilize organic carbon. And so the microbes are eating what they can, which has a very narrow range of C14, but um, the carbon that's stored there um, can be stored there for quite a long time. And there's a lot of information here that I'm obviously not talking about. What we can use the carbon-14 to, to study those mechanisms of stabilization. But right now, I'm just interested in, in the sort of faster cycling carbon pools that can respond over the next century. So here's the same data plotted against the site mean annual temperature again. And again, we have actually kind of a, a relationship. Um, we, I think what we're doing here is we're going over the bomb curve. So at these very cold tundra sites, we're um, seeing the contribution of carbon fixed before the bomb period um, to what's being respired. And um, uh, there's not such a strong uh, relationship here. You'll notice like in, this, in the tropical forest, we have actually quite, um, again, older carbon being respired. And I think that's uh, got something to do with the uh, age of roots being similar for woody plants um, across this uh, temperature range. Okay, so you know this is all very good, but but what use is it? So there are two really, um, uh, or there are two uses I want to put these data to, and one we're just starting, and the other one I'll, I'll show you. Um, the first one is just that this provides a for the first time, you know, a common currency where we can actually measure something that the models predict. So this is a. a picture of the CASA model, which is, and believe it or not, one of the more sophisticated global models that's being used to predict carbon into the future. It's a bunch of boxes, and carbon cascades through the boxes, and there are temperature and uh, texture relationships that govern the fluxes between the boxes and, and how big you know, how big the carbon stores are in each of these boxes. So one of the things we can do is compare the carbon-14 of say, you know, the soil organic matter pools with what the model predicts. But that's very difficult because the boxes here are kind of made up and they don't correspond to anything we can actually isolate in soils. Um, so the more interesting thing to do maybe is to, every time you transform carbon from one box to another, you release CO2 to the atmosphere. If we add all those up, I should get um, something that I can compare to my microbially respired carbon that I measure in my jar. And uh, uh, that's what Jim Randerson at, at Irvine and I have started to do. Um, so here's the mean age of respired carbon, and here's the cumulative fraction of the total. So, you know, the model here predicts about 35 years. Uh, for, this is just for one site, Harvard Forest in Massachusetts. Um, you know, our measurements are in the green for different pools and um, different, this, here's the overall res respired carbon being about 20 years old on our time scale. And uh, you notice the model doesn't agree very well with the measurements. Um, we have you know, almost 75% of the carbon being respired being about five years old or less, whereas the model predicts longer time scales. Um, and that's, you know, whenever you do these comparisons, you learn something. And what we've learned from this comparison so far is that Harvard Forest, the model's assuming a steady state forest, whereas Harvard Forest was a pasture or a, a, an agricultural field 100 years ago. So probably these older pools that the model is predicting have not yet come into steady state. If we take the wood out of the model, um, we get something a little bit closer to what we observe. So we've only started that comparison, but I think it's um, important. The other thing you can do is just do um, sort of very simple 
uh, observational constraints um, and very simple models to say, well, what's ecologically reasonable? Um, so I've chosen to look at um, this question of how much um, of the tropical forest uh, carbon sink that's been inferred from measurements in the Amazon and um, from measurements of a tree growth in the Amazon and inverse modeling of atmospheric CO2 concentrations um, could be due to sort of CO2 fertilization because it's being attributed to that. And so this is uh, about 10 years of work summarized on one slide, um, mostly by Jeff Chambers and uh, Simone Vieira. Um, it, so the idea is if we increase photosynthesis, so the black here are fluxes in tons of carbon per hectare per year, and the uh, red is what we're kind of saying in a simple-minded way is the age of the carbon that's being respired from each of these uh, pathways. And so if we increase photosynthesis, you know, here's the overall time lag that we would predict. Um, so, you know, here's the two to three year litter from incubations. Um, the root soil organic matter is older than what I showed you because I've added in coarse root decomposition um, to this number. And then the wood we had to do, uh, since nobody knows how old tropical trees are, we had to do a study to kind of get the ages and growth rates and then model that to come up with this number. But the idea is that the total microbial respiration at steady stage should be somewhere between 15 and 30 years old in this ecosystem, which is in pretty good agreement with the CASA model prediction this time. And then if we just do a simple-minded model and we say, okay, I'm gonna have my increase, uh, inputs increase with the partial pressure of CO2 with this um, common formulation that's in the models um, where the beta factor here is taken from uh, the free air CO2 enrichments. Um, and uh, then, we, you know, we can model how much carbon the vegetation should be taking up because we know the time lag. So we have the, the input rate times the rate at which it's increasing times the time lag gives us a pretty good estimate of how much carbon should be stored. Um, here it's, it's about a tenth of a ton per hectare per year, um, which is about um, five times less than, um, than what's being observed for tree growth at permanent plot studies. Um, if we multiply this rate times the area of the Amazon basin, we get about uh, a tenth of a, ton, a, a pentagram per hectare per year, which is too small um, to really explain the carbon uptake that has been inferred. Doesn't mean that that carbon uptake it wrong, is wrong, it just means that this is not the process that's likely to be responsible for it. Now that, um, that sink is obviously going to increase in the future, but um, I would argue that it's not going to be that important to uh, maybe get this number better because what's going to matter for the Amazon uh, carbon budget in the next 30 years is really not how much that the intact forests are doing and that they might be CO2 fertilized, but what happens, what people are going to do in the Amazon. And this is, I think, uh, something that we have to learn to put in our, geo our models, our global models. We, we're, humans are part of this system and we're not in there. Um, but uh, this is from a prediction that's based on economic and uh, uh, modeling of, uh, and land use modeling in the Amazon basin, and they're basically saying that uh, something like 15 to 30 petagrams of carbon will be released in the next 30 years if uh, sort of business as usual land use clearing goes on. Okay, the second feedback that I wanted to talk about, I don't have time to, to really go into into detail, um, which is this uh, negative feedback from soil warming. Um, the place where that is obviously going to be most important is the place that's warming the fastest in the high latitudes and where a lot of carbon is stored in, in tundra and boreal soils. And luckily, uh, Ted Schur just published uh, two weeks ago a paper in Nature that um, I'd encourage you to read if you're interested in this topic. Basically, um, the next slide. So what he did was he looked uh, um, at carbon fluxes coming from a permafrost system that had thawed that in historical times. And he was able to show with the radiocarbon signature, um, you can't tell just by looking at fluxes alone, but if you have a signal that says, yes, I'm respiring more old carbon, um, old deep carbon, so here's the mass balance, he could show that places with minimal thaw 
are, are respiring a lot less of this deep carbon than places with severe thaw in the last 20 years. And he uh, has written a couple of papers here, two references if you're interested. There's about 1,600 petagrams of carbon stored in these permafrost soils and peats. And we know that if you warm them up, they will decompose. If you warm them to above freezing, it's, it's labile organic matter that will decompose. And so he's been able to show that, that just detect increase of loss of old carbon from thawed permafrost. And he made a rough estimate in, in both of these, in, well, in the Nature paper, that in 2100, um, the most controversial thing, I think, is the rate of soil thaw, um, or the, what volume of soil is going to be thawed by 2100. But the release will be about one petagram carbon per year by the year 2100, uh, according to his estimates. So it's not going to be a you know, rapid loss, but um, loss nonetheless, if we think about what it would take to store a petagram of carbon in terrestrial ecosystems um, by land management practices. So the take home messages I want to leave you with so far are radiocarbon is a powerful tool um, for both constraining the magnitude of these feedbacks in sort of a, a very broad, you know, um, uh, back of the envelope kind of way, and for testing these uh, more sophisticated models um, and our understanding that's put into them. Then second, uh, the terrestrial, I mean, this is my personal opinion, terrestrial feedbacks in the carbon cycle are likely to be small compared to what people do, and the same is going to hold for our efforts to manage carbon sequestration. Um, the rates of uptake in soils and plants are usually slow, and the rates of loss are fast. So if we're going to manage soils to store carbon, um, first of all, we have to find places um, where we don't need to grow food to grow trees. And, um, and I'm not sure with 9 billion people we're going to do that. So I wanted to go back to this idea of living in a time of abrupt climate change. Um, ecosystems are already responding to the current warming. Um, and uh, you've probably read all about things like these even in the newspapers. Um, uh, Ann Kelly and Mike Goulden at Irvine just published a study that showed uh, mortality at the low end of the elevation range of pines in uh, Southern California forests. Um, spring is coming earlier, and uh, there have been documented changes in insect and bird migration patterns. Um, and what I think the big concern is that um, because vegetation change, which we know accompanies climate change because we see it in the paleo record, um, it requires something to die and then something new to move in. A mortality is a f process that proceeds rapidly. Um, recruitment is slow um, and stores carbon slowly. Um, so this is an example of what's concerning a lot of people right now is that we, we're going to cross uh, vegetation thresholds and some of them are being crossed right now. For example, in the massive mortality of pine, uh, sort of across the west, um, but in the Southern California mountains, we. We, uh, you've been reading about our wildfires. This is, you know, so there are a number of drivers, not just climate. Um, climate's part of it, um, drought, um, but also human management, um, air pollution, and then there are triggers, uh, in our case, uh, bark beetle infestation, and then on one day you'll get a hot, dry wind, and you have a lot of standing dead trees and mortality. And the real question is what comes next, um, and how will it, function biogeochemically, and we don't know. So there's a lot we don't know. Um, I feel like uh, we're not prepared for the change that we're going to be living in. Um, where should we be making measurements? How do we know that a fresh threshold is being crossed? Um, how are we going to be able to attribute the, the threshold responses that we see, and which are the ecosystems that are the most uh, in danger of crossing um, thresholds that won't be reversible? And then finally, what are the consequences, both in terms of feedbacks to climate change, but also in terms of the function of those ecosystems and how they impact our human sustainability. So we live in a time of both opportunities and challenges. The opportunity of living in a time of rapid change is that you can learn an awful lot about process. So you know we're pushing these ecosystems and we're pushing the climate system really hard and we're going to see some thresholds being crossed. Um, there are, but our responsibility is to, as scientists is to be able to um, uh, learn as much as we can from that. 
And then the big problem, the big challenge is that attribution is going to be difficult because everything is changing at once. And, um, and so we have to be smart. So there's, I, I'd like to echo something I've heard a lot this week, that there's, uh, you know, we need a lot of people and clever observations, experiments, and tools, and we have to be doing this fairly fast um, to keep up with climate change as it happens. So with that, I'll finish, and um, I have a lot of people to thank. Um, both, uh, I guess the main point is I, I came to this, to a field of ecology as a trained as a geochemist in chemical oceanography, and um, I had to learn what the right questions were to ask from a lot of people. Um, I also showed a lot of data from all my graduate students and postdocs, and uh, without the AMS measurements, nothing would have happened, um, and various funding sources. So thanks a lot.